Hi everyone, it's Miss Jackson. So I wanted to share the book Brave Margaret with you. And what I'd like you to do today is I want you to listen to the first paragraph. And I want you to listen and I'm going to stop at the end of it. I want you to be able to tell me all the different things we've learned about our main character, Margaret, at the end of the first paragraph. Long ago, a young woman named Margaret lived alone on a farm in County Donegal in the west of Ireland. Between the wild sea banks and rugged crags and cliffs, she found enough green grass to raise a few cattle. She was a red woman with hair and brows the color of burnished copper, skin white as milk, and cheeks ruddy as fire glow. She was wise as well as hardworking and could cast a spear or a herring net with equal skill. She lived comfortably enough, but she longed to learn what lay beyond the wide sea or behind the crags and cliffs. Okay, so I hope you are listening. And what are some of the things that we found out about Margaret? Well, one, we found out that she lives in, on a farm in Ireland. We know that on one side of her farm is the ocean, and then behind it is our cliffs. We know that she raises cattle on the farm. We know that she had red hair. We know that her skin was white as milk and her cheeks were red. We know she was wise, very intelligent. We know she was hardworking. We know that she was good at hunting with a spear and fishing with a net. And we learned that the thing that she wanted more than anything was to travel and leave the farm and see what's out there in the world, so. So you're gonna be working on writing an introductory paragraph today. And I want you to think of all the information you learned from Brave Margaret. And I would like you to um, think about that when you're writing your own paragraph and putting a lot of information in your paragraph. Now, I don't know about you, but I hate to hear the beginning of a story and never hear the end of it. So I'm gonna continue and read the story to you. One morning, Margaret rose, washed her hands and face, said her prayers, ate her food, and went to lead the cattle from their barn. To her surprise, she saw a gallant ship with lowered sails anchored in the cove below her farm. Up the path climbed the handsomest man Margaret had ever seen. I am Simon, the son of the King of the East, he said. My men and I are on a journey to the kingdoms of the cold far to the north, but we have run short of supplies and must have meat to keep up our strength. Oh, what do you know? He needs meat, Margaret has cattle. When Margaret heard him talk of places she had only dreamed of, she hungered to see more of the world. She had also fallen a bit in love with Simon. Nothing mattered but that she go to sea with him and his brave company. I will give you my cattle, she told him, if you take me with you. Simon refused at first, offering her gold beyond her cattle's worth, but she made up her mind that he would have no cattle if he did not take her with them. At last, Simon agreed that both Margaret and her cattle would come aboard. Then Simon turned the ship's prow seaward. His crew raised the red and white sails and they overtook the wind ahead as easily as they outran the wind behind. But soon the wind failed and a mist covered the sea. At Simon's command, his men lowered the sails and rowed for two days. Margaret put her back to an oar along with the others. At dawn on the third day, the mist lifted. Then they found themselves adrift in strange seas. In the distance was a shore low and gray. Overhead, the sky grew cloud heavy, fierce with thunder and lightning. Winds churned the waters to froth. Suddenly, a sea serpent erupted in a burst of spray. Simon shouted a warning to his men as the monster hurtled toward them. Towering over the ship, the creature roared, Throw me the red woman, or I will swallow all of you. Never, cried Simon, drawing his sword. His men did the same. The monster hissed, but hesitated. Unnoticed, Margaret lowered a small boat and rowed away. I will not be guilty of your death, she cried. What happens now is the will of God. As soon as the serpent saw her, it turned from the ship, opened wide its jaws, and bore down on Margaret. The young woman stood, pulling an axe from the folds of her skirt. She knew she had but a single chance to defeat the onrushing beast. So she held herself in check until the monstrous jaws yawned wide in front of her. At the last moment, she flung her axe deep into the creature's mouth, wounding it terribly. The dying monster thrashed about, raising huge waves. 
they swept Simon's ship far out to sea and hurled Margaret's boat landward. She was tossed onto the shore, striking her head on the side of the boat so that she was knocked senseless. Toward evening, the falling rain woke her. She saw no trace of Simon's ship on the storm-wracked sea. Inland, Margaret spotted a light. This guided her to a rude stone hut. Through the single window, she saw an old woman facing a peat fire. She rapped on the door. When the old woman opened it, Margaret asked, Will you give me shelter for the night? I will, said the woman. Come in. She gave Margaret bread and milk and a place to sleep by the fire. The cottage was unremarkable, save for two things. Upon the wall was a sword with a blade shining sun bright. Beneath it, a silver ring hung from a cord. When Margaret asked about these, the old woman replied, I once lived in a castle at White Dune. A giant drove me from my home and took all except that ring and sword. Only the champion, whose finger fits the ring, can lift down the sword of light, slay the giant, and give me back my holdings. Many brave men have tried, but their fingers proved too big or small for the ring. They could not take the sword of light, so the giant slew them. The whiteness of White Dune is the whiteness of their bones. The storm raged for days. Margaret stayed in the cottage doing tasks the old woman set for her. Whenever the wind and rain eased, she would scan the sea, but she could find no sign of Simon. She imagined a ship dashed to bits and him clinging to some sea-bound rock. Storm or none, she vowed, I will put to sea and search for him. But as Margaret prepared to leave, there was a knock on the cottage door. Opening it, she found herself face to face with Simon. For a moment, they gaped in astonishment, then they hugged each other. I have been searching for you all this time, he said, and I was about to go in search of you, she said. They gave no thought to the old woman watching them until she told Margaret, you'll not be going away just yet. Who's to say what I can and can't do, Margaret snapped, yet something in the woman's eyes chilled her. Simon put his hand upon his sword hilt, but the old woman laughed. You can no more draw your sword, she said, than the woman can leave this place. It was true. When Simon tried to draw his sword, his fingers grew numb, and his arm hung limply at his side. When Margaret tried to walk away, she found her feet frozen in place. They realized that the woman was a hag of sorceries. Or, in our case, we would say a witch. What is your price to free us? asked Simon. The red woman stays until the giant at White Dune is slain, the hag answered. Then I will give her to you and welcome. I will slay him or die trying, vowed Simon. When Margaret begged him not to go, he said, You cannot keep me from this any more than I could keep you from sailing with me. Then he added tenderly, And I know now that I cannot live apart from you. The old woman said, Try the ring on your finger. If it fits, you can carry my sword of light against the giant. Simon untied the ring, but the circle of silver was too small for his finger. When he tried to take down the sword of light, he could not budge it from the wall. Away with you, the hag said, tying the ring back to the cord. You are not the champion I await, but the woman stays. She will be the prize that draws a true champion. I will face the giant with my own sword, Simon declared. Again, Margaret begged him not to go, but Simon did not listen. One of the horses from my stable will carry you to White Dune, said the hag. Helplessly, Margaret watched Simon ride toward the hills. After a time, the old woman stoked the hearth fire and tossed some herbs into it. In the flames, Margaret saw white dune littered with the bones of fallen warriors. Over the field brooded a castle of black stone. As Margaret gazed, Simon's horse galloped into view. At that moment, the doors of the castle burst open and the giant lumbered forth, his club raised. He bellowed. Fee, fum, foe, fay, what foolish mortal comes this way? Churl or champion, king's son or knave, one blow of my club puts you in your grave. For Margaret, Simon shouted, charging with drawn sword. Bravely he fought, and several times he wounded the giant. In the cottage, Margaret prayed that Simon would deliver a fatal stroke, but in the end, the giant swung his club and Simon sprawled lifeless in the dust. Shouting in shock and rage, Margaret spun about, frantic to strike back at the monster. On impulse, she snapped the ring from its cord. It slipped easily onto her finger. I am the champion you've waited for, Margaret cried to the astonished old woman. What fools we are for thinking it must be a man who slays that great dirty giant. Margaret took down the sword of light. 
Hurrying to the stables, she saddled a horse that galloped, swift as the March wind to White Dune. Do you hear the simile in there? Swift as March wind. When the giant heard her horse's hooves, he bellowed, Fee, bum, fo, fay, what foolish mortal comes this way? Churler, champion, king, son, or knave, one blow of my club puts you in your grave. Seeing Margaret, he threw back his head and laughed. But Margaret, spurred on by the sight of Simon's lifeless body, charged forward. Her sword of light bit deep into the giant's thigh, and his laughter ended in a bellow of pain. He swung his club, but Margaret wheeled her horse, ducking his blow. As their battle raged, Margaret's sword blows shattered trees. The stones of the black castle danced when the giant slammed the ground with his club. At last, Margaret cut the monster's ankles, dropping him to his knees. For Simon, Margaret cried and struck the giant's head from his shoulders. Dismounting, she knelt beside Simon's body, whipping, weeping bitter tears. Suddenly, the hag of sorceries appeared before her. Away with you, cried Margaret. You have cost me my dearest love. Follow me, said the other. What is done may still be undone. Heartbroken yet hopeful, Margaret followed the old woman into the castle of black stone. There, the woman lifted a green bottle from an oaken chest. This is the water of healing, she said, uncorking it. She dabbed a drop upon her forehead. Instantly, she became a youthful, raven-haired beauty. Do you know what color ravens are? They're black, so I like that. Instead of saying black-haired beauty, raven-haired. Then the woman sprinkled the water of healing upon Simon, who immediately returned to life. After this, she gave Margaret and Simon purses filled with gold and silver and bade them return to the shore where Simon's ship was anchored. The crew hoisted sail. When they reached the kingdom of the east, the ruler, Simon's father, gave Margaret a hundred thousand welcomes. Then came the priest of the Paytons and the clerk of the Bells to marry the pair. Their wedding lasted nine nights and nine days, but their happiness lasted a lifetime. So I hope you enjoyed it and good luck with your powerful first paragraph.